Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to another episode of On the Couch with Creatives. I say good morning because I'm here in the UK, but good afternoon or good evening if you're anywhere else in the world. I'm Melanie Perry. And I'm Julie Hagmew. And this is On the Couch with Creatives. Fans and followers of the show will know by now that we're part of the Creatives Group, the private network for creative professionals everywhere. Together, we help to connect you with like-minded individuals, help you create at your best, and therefore help you to grow and develop your creative business. If that sounds like a good idea to you and you'd like to find out more, please don't hesitate to contact us after the show. We would love to speak to you. But this is On The Couch. So Julie, who do we have on the couch today? Well, today we are chatting on the couch with Desiree Nyandu. Desiree is an author, an artist, and a businesswoman, and she has a very interesting life story. She was born into a Zulu family, and as everybody knows, the Zulus are a tribe in South Africa, but she was born in Turkey, and she's now living in the USA. And uh, her books are aimed at introducing children of the African diaspora to connect and gain cultural competence at an early age. So let's get her on the couch and hear all about it. Hello, Desiree, all the way from Washington, D.C. Welcome to On the Couch with Creative. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, you're a very interesting lady, very <laughs> interesting lady. So as soon as I saw um, your children's book um, on social media, it's so beautiful. Um, and then I started reading up about you and I thought, wow, this is somebody we need to talk to because there's so much more than being a children's author, an author, whatever. Um, there's so much more going on in what you're doing. So um, describe to us exactly what your aim, your purpose in life is. What exactly, who are you and what are you doing? In life? Oh, well, okay. First and foremost, to um, teach my children. I am a mother of four, so top of my list in all things is to reach my four kids. And once I learned the things that they really need and are excited about and the things that are helping them to become their own people, I decided I wanted to share that with other children as well and help other parents to reach their kids. And so it just kind of um, became more of my my mission is to reach children. And it, it just kind of spiraled from there. Um, all the things that I do, my art, my writing, um, I homeschool. So in, my children kind of envelop everything that I do. And now it's become bigger and envelops other people's children as well. It's very interesting because obviously you have um, a Zulu family background, but did you, you didn't grow up in South Africa, did you? No, no. Um, so I'm an American. Um, my parents are Americans. My grandparents are Americans. Um, I married a, a South African oh. a man and uh, we met in college and he loves his country, loves his culture, loves his people. And that just kind of like crept in um, with the other things that I was teaching the kids. So um, those things kind of melded. So you weren't born in a Zulu, into a Zulu uh, family. Your husband is Zulu. My husband is Zulu. Ah, oh, gotcha. Well, I find it very interesting, um, Desiree, that you said you homeschool. Um, I, I only have one child. And I had to homeschool over lockdown and it nearly killed me. <laughs> Seriously, I would never, ever, ever do it again. Ever. <laughs> it is a lot. It is not for the faint of heart. Uh, it takes it takes um, a special kind of patience that I think I'm still trying to acquire at this moment. <laughs> So for every, anybody who says that they, they're not going to do it or they can't do it, I, I completely understand. Yeah, I, I can't. How do, you, how 
do you teach your children and obviously um, other people's children um, within the African diaspora, how do you teach them Zulu? You, you're writing about Zulu culture, Zulu traditions, Zulu folk tales, Zulu yeah. proverbs, Zulu sayings, but you yourself are not Zulu. So uh, did you learn the language from your husband? How did you manage to sort of seep the Zulu culture into your life? Yeah. Um, so when we were first dating, I was very interested in all of the cultural aspects, the language of um, my husband. And um, funny enough, he he was like, oh, you know, you know, one day you'll learn those things. He wasn't quite into uh, teaching me those things. But now he's a, a professor of Zulu. It's ironic. But um, I kind of sought those things out myself. I was like, I really want to know. Um, about this guy and his culture and his language. So I found different things online, sources that I could buy books from. And so I got a very basic level understanding of Zulu. And that's really all you need to teach kids because once they kind of learn the rules, um, they hear their father speaking, they hear their uh, um, their uncle speaking, they talk to other family members, and they kind of apply them. I would even dare to say that they probably surpassed me at this point. <laughs> so um, I've created uh, workbooks for them, coloring pages, the same way you would teach them any sort of other um, subject by involving all of their senses. Um, that's a good way to get them to learn languages too. Do you visit the Zulu family in South Africa? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So one of my, um, I guess, core needs was before we decided to get married, I said, I have to go visit your family first. And um, I was amazed. It was, it was so beautiful. One of the biggest things that stood out to me was this place is so green and beautiful when I went out into some more rural areas it was it was wonderful and I was like okay I think I could marry this guy and the culture is so rich and it colorful is. and and you know they have exquisite manners they are such oh, beautiful yeah. people and with the greatest sense of humor I must say out of everybody that I've met in all the travels around the world I would say the Zulu people have got the greatest sense of humor I've ever come across. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I had to I had to adjust my mind a bit because I wasn't quite understanding. I was like, are, are we, are we, oh, that's a joke. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But once I was staying there for a little while, um, I, I just got into it. It was, it was wonderful. I stayed with people I didn't know, um, they didn't know me. They weren't even family members. People would just be like, oh, hey, what are you doing? And if there's something in common, they would say, you want to come by my house and we can have lunch? And I would say, sure. It was it was a wonderful experience. Well, to be fair, South Africans across the board, because there are so many colors and races and classes and, and, and different cultures in South Africa. Um, but across the board, South Africans are very hospitable. But can you speak um, conversational Zulu? You can you can actually communicate with your husband's family. I can I can understand what they're saying just enough to make sure that uh, that the kids aren't saying anything they're not supposed to, and um, yeah, I can I can say enough just to make sure that I can talk above the children's head as well when we need to hide something. But that's about it. <laughs> I took um I took Melanie and her husband to South Africa one year and we traveled around. We didn't make it to Zululand, uh oh. to Zulu Um so she she never saw it. But what she did see of South Africa she absolutely loved, didn't you, Melanie? Yeah, like a lot of people that, that I've spoken to who have been to South Africa, uh or Africa, say that they you know left part of my soul in Africa. Oh. Because it's so big. It's so oh. big you, you you feel very it, it's very humbling to be out in the bush. Oh, yes. Oh, I was out in the dark when we, we we arrived at nighttime. And I was like, I've never seen this level of dark before. I was waving my hand in front of my face. And I was like, this is a whole other world right now. 
but um it yeah when you get out there out there it's it's like you're in a a, a different place yeah a completely other world than here in dc <laughs> Let's talk about your business. Um, it's a publishing company, is it? Zulunomics? Yes, yes. Um, so my husband and I started it, and we kind of along the same lines of me and my children and reaching other children. He is more on the the college level. So right now he teaches at Howard University and he teaches Zulu there. And a lot of his experience with students, college students, and parents that wanted their college level students to learn Zulu kind of melded with my um, experience with parents wanting to learn their or wanting their children to learn Zulu. And those were elementary students. So we kind of created this Zulunomics to address the concerns of both sides. And as time went on, we're kind of growing to address people who want to learn Zulu language and culture who aren't students at all, who aren't children, um, just adults who are just traveling to South Africa. So that means that we have now flashcards and posters, workbooks, all of those things, mainly for, for kids and students. But now we're expanding a bit and it's, it's been fun. Uh, before we get into the children's books, because your children's book is just beautiful, um, you you have published something called 99 Zulu Proverbs and Sayings. Yes. Now, obviously, you must have lent a lot on your husband to find those proverbs and sayings. Or did he help you? Is he also a co-author of the book? He is a co-author. And um, I would say that although... The translation part is definitely all him. I, I didn't know the translation of these things, the, the proverbs at all. Um, I actually started writing down things that he was saying that didn't make any sense to me. You so, mean saying in English? You say it in English and and, and then obviously it's a Zulu exactly. saying that makes no sense in English. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> so uh, he would say something like, no, no frog jumps for another frog. And... <laughs> I, I would say, okay, um, sure. And I would write that down. No um, elephant finds its trunk too heavy. Uh, I would write that down. That's and, a beautiful saying. Right? It, wow. It, it's wonderful. Um, I And he, I don't think he realized how integrated these sayings were into his everyday vocabulary because I would mention what he would say and he would say, oh yeah, that, you know what that means. It means this and this. But um, it wasn't a big deal for him, but it it was so beautiful to me. And I had to write them down. I didn't write them with the intention of writing a book, but um, I don't actually really know what my intention was. I just thought it would be nice to have them. And soon after maybe a year of just randomly writing these things, I had over a hundred different sayings that he would just blurred out, you know, um, at, at different times. And I said, you know what, we should translate these and we should adapt them so that people could understand what they mean. And he was like, okay, actually that, that sounds like a good idea. And so the book was born and, um, people have really found it interesting and helpful because it not only just translates, but it, um, interprets as well. But why 99? Why not 120? I think the human brain is kind of adapted to make everything even and go by tens or by fives or something like that. And I think in my head, I thought it would stand out. It would look a little weird if it said 99 instead of 100. It would make people look twice. <laughs> wow. That was the marketing ploy as well, because if things seem a little bit less than something, it gets people to buy nine ninety nine. Exactly. When you ninety nine e. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what I was hoping. I don't know if that if that was accomplished, but I was I was definitely going for 
something that would make someone say, hey, why is that 99 versus 100? Let's talk about Isizulu letters and blends. Now, is this more on the children's um, level or, or on the level of adults learning Zulu for the first time? Well, I think that's the good thing about that book. It's made for children, but I believe that adults learning Zulu for the first time, if they pick up that book, it would really help them with pronunciation. So in English, there are sounds, or there are, or sorry, in Zulu, there are sounds that you won't find in the English language. And a lot of people, especially without the audio, kind of have trouble understanding what these letters are supposed to sound like, or this these blends of letters are supposed to sound like. So those uh, blends and letters also have at the bottom of the page what it's supposed to sound like as it comes out of your mouth. And so um, if you are just traveling and you want to work on your Zulu, that's a great way to do it without having the constraints of saying, I need internet so I can listen to the audio. And then of course, like I said, it was made for children. So um, I, th I think that's the great thing about the Letters and Glenn's book. Mm. Because a, a lot of people coming to South Africa, when they go and visit Kisluwi, um Game Reserve. Oh, yes. If, if, if you say Kisluwi, they don't know what you're talking about because the way it's written, H-L-U, mm -hmm. you know, and then the U-H-L-E, how on earth do you actually <laughs> pronounce that in English? Like, yep. ooh, Okay, okay. It, it, uh, early, early. How do you pronounce it? Exactly. So my parents, like I said, I'm an American. My parents, being an American, um, you know, they are very into wanting their child, their grandchildren, to learn their Zulu language from their father's side, and so um, they try to encourage. And so my mother, especially, is like, "How do you? How do you say it?" So I actually gave her the letters in Blend's book. And we work with her. Um, and so when we're doing the HL, I'm always like, put your tongue at the back of your teeth, at the front and blow. And then so that's the best way I can can teach her. And so actually by teaching her and teaching my children, that's um, kind of how the, the Letters and Blends book grew or became because um, I had to teach. And the thing, the strategies that I used or the, um, the comparisons that I used with them, I know they were successful. So I had to put them in a book. So hopefully somebody else would find them helpful. So now talk about your children's books. Let's talk about that. Let's. <laughs> so um, I started off with Mbila's Tale, very similar to the, the story of how I became started with 99 Proverbs, I would hear my husband speaking about some stories that he heard when he was growing up. And I was like, wow, that's beautiful. Where is that? Where can we get that story? Because I want those those books on my, my children's shelves. I want that to be a part of their collection, something that they can choose from. And he was like, oh, well, they're not written down. And I, I, I was kind of confused what do you mean you're they're not written down these are stories that you're saying that you know and your brother knows and your neighbors and your cousins would all know but they're not written anywhere oh no of course not so um I kind of made it a bit of a mission to incorporate these stories written down somewhere and um and publish them for my children and for other people's children that have grown up with those stories, have that nostalgia. And so Mbila's Tale is a story about a little animal, I guess it's a, called a Dossi or a Hyrax in, in Zulu, it would be called an Mbila. And it doesn't have a tail. And it's the story of why he does not have a tail. He's a, he's a little lazy. And um, the kids really did enjoy it. The fun thing about that particular book is it's a flip book. So on one side, it's in Zulu. The other side is in English. It can be used as a teaching tool for learning Sizulu, as well as just reading for fun. The African stories are wonderful. Obviously, there's an oral tradition. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, in, in African tribes. And if you go back, I mean, even today, you sit around the fire and, and grandma and grandpa tell you the stories and, and, and why the che- how the cheetah got its spots and why the elephant, how it got its long nose. And then stunning stories, lovely stories. But for children of the African diaspora like yours, um, they, they, they don't have that every day. They're not sitting around a fire with, with grandpa and grandma and listening to stories that their grandpas and their grandmas told them. So to, to have that on your children's bookshelf is such a wonderful idea. Really, it is. Thank you. Yes, that's completely the idea. They're not interacting with their South African side of the family all the time. Um, they're hearing mainly English and the hope is for for us to one day move back to South Africa, and um, I would hate for them to feel completely lost in a place where we want to call home. And those books, those stories, create pieces of or uh, create pieces of home that they can have here. And hopefully, you know, when that does happen, that move does eventually happen. Um, they'll feel a little bit more comfortable. They'll feel a little bit more integrated and um, they'll understand a little bit more because of these books. Yeah, it, 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 the culture stock is great. Um, you know, my my parents, my father was English, my mother Welsh, but they met and married in South Africa and I was born and brought up in South Africa. And when I married my husband and came over to the UK, I thought, oh, it would be easy because, you know, my father was English, my mother was Welsh. Uh, I had it was, even for me. I had such a culture shock. So even for your children, knowing the language and knowing the proverbs and the sayings and the stories, it's still going to be a culture shock. Going from Washington D.C. to a crawl in the middle of Kazuna Natal, still a culture shock. It's going to be a huge culture shock. Well, the, I'll be going through it with them. I mean, when I went to South Africa, um, I mean, it was for a month, but I mean, I, I've only ever lived here. I mean, I've lived in Turkey um, for a few years. I was born there, um, traveling, going to the UK, going throughout the Caribbean. It's it's just not the same as living in one spot. So that's that's the good thing is that we'll be going through it together. Nice. I, I want to think you're doing the right thing and 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 preparing the road so to speak, you know, but rather that than go in and have a complete change. At least they'll have some familiarity with the, the yeah. traditions yeah. and the language, as you say. That's that's my hope. I, I'm I'm doing the best I can with what I have here. So hopefully it, it will make the road a bit easier for them. I'm sure it will. I I get a feeling, and t- tell me if I'm if I'm right or wrong that the um, African-American, Black uh, black Americans, Americans who have obviously been descended from the slaves from Africa, that the disconnect between them and Africa is so great. And that there's this yearning to actually find their roots, find the, the Africanness in them. And somebody like you, I don't know your family background, but the fact that you married a Zulu man, an African who speaks an African language, comes from an African country, um, that must bring so much richness, I would assume, and cultural identity into your family as American. I would say... um I think in general, yes, African Americans really do want to connect with something deeper and don't want our story or our history to stop at slavery. And so um a big issue that that people find is trying to find close that gap in between um where Ever their their ancestors were and slavery, finding that space and who were those people that were brought on ships? Who were those people um, that didn't have names that were just counted as numbers um, that were almost like cattle? And um, 
I think finding an identity in Africa, wherever it is, is important to a lot of people because um, that almost, uh, not erases, but that almost starts to heal that part of history that creates a bridge over that part of history where we know there was more to us before um, slavery. And I think personally, um, I don't think I had it initially that I was like, oh, you know, I need to go to Africa. But I think once I did go visit, I was like, oh, I think this is this is something that I need to explore, something that I I would like to know more about. It, it wasn't something that I knew that I needed until I actually had it, which was is it worked out wonderfully for me um, that I met Piwo and um, that we got married. And my my family just has so many questions for him, him um, about the continent, about his growing up. And I think it does it it does help them a lot. And I think mostly it helps his students. Yeah. They ask him so many questions. The American students here, Black Americans, they want to know all about it. And that actually is why he's started doing um, South African visits with the the college students in his class. I, th- I think that's absolutely marvellous. As you say, a lot of this though revolves around your your husband and his culture have you ever traced your roots your african roots and and, and know where your family comes from and and trace any family history on your side you know that's that's a great question i there's so there's like i mentioned before the gap um i did do i think it's ancestry.com And you spit in this little tube and they give you this whole map of where you could be from or where your ancestors were most likely from. And so that was great and very helpful. They say, okay, um, a little bit of Congo, a little bit of um, Nigeria and a little bit of, um, I think, Senegalese or something like that. Um, And that's what makes up me. And, And that was that was great. It was actually really what we kind of anticipated would it would be but um I've been trying to instead of just saying where those people my ancestors would have been from I want to put names and I want to put um tribal associations and stuff like that um and that's been very difficult especially when you consider a person not a person and you don't name them you, you all that's in records is that there was a female and um, she's about 23 years old and this is where we sold her. So um, it, it it makes it, it's very sad. It's very difficult to do. It's a very arduous process. So mm-hmm. um, I've, I've gotten through portions of it. Yeah. It is I'd sad like to... because, because oh. woman number six or, um, you know, teenager number 16, <sighs> How on earth do you trace that? There's no name. There's, you know, because a, a lot of the tribes in that Western and Central African area, where obviously most of the slaves, the transatlantic slaves, um, mm-hmm. came from, there are just so many tribes. They're so different in themselves. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just to be called number six or, you know, uh, lot seven, January lot, lot seven, I mean, as you say, they were regarded as cattle. So how difficult. It's, it's quite a difficult process, yeah. And I imagine, say, from, from that, I don't know, from a number, before that, there wouldn't be anything because the, the, the African slavers who, who shipped these, you know, they didn't, that sounds awful to say, they didn't really care. It was just, you know, we're shipping these people. They wouldn't have kept records themselves because they were not how can we say any better than they should be, so to, so to speak? And, and you know, all these people that got shipped off, a bit like with the Irish, sort of similar thing. And it, it must be, it's kind of heartbreaking to think that, that your ancestor stops at a number or there's nothing, it, you can't, it would be very difficult, I mean, to go back before but with uh, it's interesting so with ancestry.com my my sister-in-law did it and um she's got 
it's a Scandinavian and gold notes, whatever. And I thought, you know what, if we all did these things, we would all find that we're a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of the other. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big argument for world peace, to be quite honest, because actually none of us are pure A, B or C. We're all a mesh. We've all been melded together over the years for so long. Yeah. Uh, but in the word terms of Harry Potter, you know, there's no pure blood anymore. Anywhere. They are, they are, they are, they are. It'd be hard put. The Amazon tribes and that Indian tribe on that island in India and the purest oh, blood. Oh, God, I don't want to sound weird like this. But the Welsh um, have oh, very little. Welsh. You know, the Welsh, they, 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 their bloodline, the Celtic bloodline goes back. Yeah, but if you went into Wales now, Julie, seriously. Oh, no, not, no. Well, yeah, but I I'm think saying, people that are alive today. People that were alive today, and even back in Britain, you know, you would not find, I guarantee you would not find anywhere, anybody with what, what pure Anglo-Saxon, that, you know, we've been conquered by the Vikings, we've been conquered by the Romans, we've been conquered by God knows ever. It's like, we're all, we're all a part of each other in this world now, pretty much. So it's about time we just stop fighting each other and just embrace each other, because actually we're all relatives under the skin anyway. So I think we should just all just, you know, world peace. Thank you, because actually we're all like we're all each other's brothers and sisters now. You know, we are. My mother told me when I was very young and growing up in apartheid South Africa. So you know, it uh, it was it was difficult to to um, marry what I was um, hearing from my parents and what I was seeing out in the world. But um, she once said to me, you know, one day we'll all be a lovely coffee cup, and it's feasible. It's feasible, but all all coffee coloured, but with different cultural traditions. And if there's one thing that's going to happen in your family, says Ray Wilson Yan uh, is that you are going to hold on tight to your Zulu traditions, your Zulu culture. And I think it's important for you. And, and do you find Syria as well that it becomes more important? These things can become more important when you become a parent. Oh. For sure. You know, for because sure. you want your heritage and your roots and, and to have that, you don't want to lose it because once it's gone, it's gone. You know, if we don't pass it down, we don't pass the history. Well, I I feel a great, um, and I, I say this like, like a great a weight on me in particular, because a lot of these things especially come from the mother with me being the homeschooler with me being the uh, person with them about 99% of the time, that responsibility of letting them know of their heritage, um, the languages that they should know. Um, there's the spiritual aspects of them becoming um, good human beings and um, good grownups <laughs> in the world. That's, really all on me that's a lot of my responsibility so yeah um I definitely see that that became a lot more important you know um after I, I became a parent and do you have plans for more uh children's books absolutely completely so um we have a new book Cindy that should be coming out and it's a Zulu Cinderella my daughter was reading um a book there's so many parodies and, and different versions of Cinderella. So she was reading one of those and she thought out loud, mom, I just, I, I don't know why there's not a Zulu Cinderella. And I said, that's a really good idea. Maybe we should make that a part of our homeschool. Maybe you should kind of write a paper about Zulu Cinderella. And the more we talked about it, I thought, you know, this actually might be a really good book. Um, this, this could work. In the States, I'm not sure in, in the UK, um, but fairy tales are a big part of the public school curriculum. And even private schools do use it quite often. And they use different cultural versions of Cinderella and Red Riding Hood. And it's it's actually a, a, a big business. So I, I was like, this could this could really work. And we started writing and we started connecting with people that said, wow, that would be really cool. And it's been about a year and a half now, and it's finally happening. We've got illustrations done by our wonderful illustrator, Shayna. 
and she's in South Africa, actually. And now the formatting is done. Now we are just waiting for the prints. And I'm super excited for this book to launch. And I'm really excited for my daughter to see her idea come together. And I'm like, you're going to be an author, baby. Oh, I love that. That's absolutely brilliant. And I love, and again, talking about you know, the Zulu heritage, and I'm, Julie's, Julie's going to take a breath now because I'm about to get on my soapbox just for five minutes. <laughs> but we, because we talk about a lot, it being in film and production and coming from a Disney background. Oh, okay. The one thing that really irritates me about Disney is when they rehash kind of classics and just put diverse people in and it's the same old, same old. And I said to Julie before, and I said, Julie, maybe Julie and, and you can collaborate on something. But I said, there are so many rich stories from African history. Certainly there are, you know, many male heroes. There are female heroes. If you dig into it, there are so many. I mean, you've done a story about Cinderella, which is which is lovely. But there are there are people within the, the historical culture that if you dig and talk to the old people and find out the story, Disney could make some epic either cartoons or live action with great diverse cast and crew that are real proper African stories that need to be told. And there's so many wonderful stories that need should be told. And I would rather hear those. Mm. They're just another remake of Snow White. Well, I've done Snow White, liked it the first time. That'll do. Thanks. You know, don't okay. just 50 million times. Or, 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 or another one that Julie and I get on our soapbox about is like the remake of The Lord of the Rings. I don't oh. want to see The Lord of the Rings hash 120,000. Give me something new that is going to that is going to educate and enthrall a new generation. Mm. I hear you. I hear no, you. No, I would love that. It's like saying they're going to remake The Sound of Music. Are you crazy? There's oh. only ever going to be one, and every generation will love it. You don't have to remake it and remake it, but some stories can be retold and retold differently. Yeah. So the idea of a of an African Cinderella story, you know, the story of Shaka Zulu, Shaka, King Shaka's mother, well, she was a bit of a Cinderella, but that didn't um, end happening. You know, she just married the prince. You know, she was shunned. Um, mm -hmm. And he was basically a bastard. And he was shunned. And, you know, all that anger. They'll give it to Disney and they'll Disneyfy it and they'll all live happily ever after. Can you imagine <laughs> Disney getting hold of Shaka Zulu's story and making it... Oh. Have this, <laughs> African warrior singing in the rolling hills of KwaZulu Natal about how wonderful it is to be a king. Oh, no, I don't think Disney could touch oh, that. Oh, yeah. But, but really, they need to. I mean, quite a few films have been made about him, but but uh, there needs to be an epic, epic film about mm. him. Epic. I mean, he was the African Napoleon, you know? He was an amazing. Anyway, yeah. we could carry on talking about this forever in a day. Let's talk about your top tips now. You're a, an author, obviously, an artistic person, You um, and you're a businesswoman. You've started your own publishing company, and what top tips would you give to people wanting to become a children's author, wanting to become a children's publisher, wanting to touch with another culture or their husband's culture or their wife's culture or their grandparents' culture and wanting to put it out into the world? What three top tips do you have? Okay. So the first one is to incorporate your own story. I think that people might find their own story maybe um, mundane or pedestrian and not interesting, but what you might find normal or not exciting, somebody might find inspirational. And so incorporating parts of you into your story um, not only gives it authenticity, but it helps people relate because now they're like, oh, that's possible. Even if it's a fairy tale or a, um, a fiction story, pieces of you in there can really um, ignite somebody's hope or um, inspire children. Because when you're talking about your book or when they're reading about it and how it came to be, they can say, wow, that, that was actually real. That actually happened. 
And um, yeah, I think that's important to have um, a part of you in, in your own story. And the second one would be to have patience. Children's books are not for people who want like instant right now um, publishing. If you are uh, making a children's book, um, especially a, a picture book, we're talking about illustrations. We're talking about word count limits. We're talking about um, making sure the vocabulary is on par with the the students that you're or the children that you're trying to have the book marketed to. You have to make sure that you're working well with your um, illustrator and that those illustrations are taking the manuscript and elevating it. There's so many different moving parts and a lot of time it's going to take a while. So um, if you're interested in getting something done very quickly, a children's book might not be <laughs> the way you want to go. Um, and then the last thing, what was that? Um, I think I wrote it down somewhere. Oh, marketing. It is now everyone's concern. It is not just if you are um, getting traditionally published, you still need to think about marketing. If you are self-publishing, you definitely must think about marketing and not just for sales, but how you want to write the story. Um, there are some things that you can put in the story that might be more authentic to you. And that's OK, because you are only marketing to a certain demographic. But if there are if you are trying to market to a, a wide, diverse population and you're trying to make lots of money, then there be certain things that you can't put in your story. And um, you think about those things at the beginning so that way you're not making big changes later on and costing yourself time. And um, that's especially true if you are a um, self-publisher. If you are going traditionally published, they will definitely tell you, nope, can't put that, can't put that. But um, either way, they're going to ask you to be a part of their marketing team. And if you're self-publishing, you are the marketing team. So those are my top three, marketing, patience, and authenticity. Brilliant. I love that. I love that. Um, and look forward to, to your the Zulu uh, Cinderella as well, because I think that I think it is a lovely, lovely idea, as you say. Some, some stories are just evergreen. And um, well, I do hope we do see more from you more stories too traditional stories I would love that too okay now now this is our our on the couch part of on the couch Desiree we're going to sneak into that psyche of yours okay. and get to know you a little bit better okay oh, my, cards, my beautiful cards okay I'm going to run my finger along the cards and just say stop when you want me to pick a card Oh, the big one sticking out the top. Okay. What have we picked? So we're going to ask you creatively about the value on the card. <laughs> so let's have a look. What did you, aha, uh -huh. you picked recognition, the value of recognition. So we're going to ask hmm. you creatively about recognition. What is array? Does recognition mean to you? What does it look, feel, and sound like? Oh, okay. Recognition to me would be nostalgia. So recognizing if you go into a store and you see something that looks like you're grandmother's vase and it's just oh, wow um so it feels like warmth and um it sounds like a song that you've heard before um yeah it just it it touches your heart because it's something that you've known before that's what how it resonates with me <laughs> something you recognize something you remember yeah. I think it is a part of yourself. Exactly. Which is actually a big part of my books. I yeah. um, One of the things that I wanted to do with the Cinderella thing, um, I wanted people to say, oh, Cinderella, I know it. And then to also see parts of 
their culture. So for the people who are buying in South Africa, for them, you know, to Zulu people to say, oh, wow, yeah, I, I know this part of the story or I know this part of the story. And for the people here in the States to say, oh, Cinderella, I love that story. So, um, yeah, to recognize, to look at something and feel that instant nostalgia. So your, your Cinderella could actually cross cultural divides purely because so many people of various cultures and colors would recognize Cinderella, the story of. Yes. And, that, and, you know, we we really, all have that in our cultures in some yeah. way. Oh, yes. It's been absolutely wonderful meeting you, Desiree, and it's been wonderful talking to you. And I hope you will keep in touch with creators because the things that you are doing um, are, are just absolutely wonderful. I mean, that's, that's why I contacted you in the first place, because uh, what you were doing just resonated with me. And we wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Oh, thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Julie, for having me. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate the time on the couch. Oh, it's been so lovely having us. So some guests we just could talk to all day. You're one of those <laughs> wonderful. We could talk all day. We need a ser- series. An hour's not enough. But we we run out of time, and I have to say goodbye. And I'm like, I don't want to say goodbye. What? Do you- <laughs> I just say thank you to Julie for joining me on the couch, and thank you so much, Desiree, and thank you so much to our wonderful audience for watching our episode today as well. But until next time, we'll see you. Yeah.